Good afternoon and welcome to the Workplace Wellbeing Show Connect 2021. This is the third of five live webinars, one taking place each day this week. My name is Ian Hart. I'm the editor of SHP. If you've missed any of the other live sessions from the first couple of days um, of Safety and Health Expo or Workplace Wellbeing Show Connect, please don't worry. They're all available on demand within the platform until the end of July, as with this session as well. In this session, sponsored by Westfield Health, we're going to be discussing what adjustments you need to consider as we return to work in the new normal and how to help colleagues adapt to change. I'm delighted to be joined by Tiffany Argent, Nick Wright, Peter Kelly and Richard Holmes. And in a moment, I'm going to ask each of the panel to briefly introduce themselves. Before we get to that, I'd like to remind you that this is an interactive panel debate. So please do get your questions into the panel as you're watching, and I'll try and get through as many of those as we can during the session. And you can find the Q&A box in the top right hand side of your screen. Right, let's meet today's panel. Richard, if you'd like to bring uh, briefly introduce yourself, please. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Ian. Richard Holmes. I'm the Director of Wellbeing at Westfield Health. Uh, my role is managing our UK-wide health and wellbeing business where we support organisations, corporate workplace organisations, with their health and wellbeing uh, needs for their employees. Perfect. Thank you. And Nick? Hi, Ian. Uh, afternoon all. So I'm Nick Wright. I work for Vodafone Business. Um, I sit within the group team, so I have a global remit. So I'm responsible for the health, safety and well-being of um, teams that operate globally in, in all regions around the world. Thanks, Nick. And yourself, Peter? Uh, Peter Kelly. I'm a senior psychologist for the health and safety executive. And behind me is clearly is my back garden and my pool. Um, um, but I'm, I, I wish, um, this is actually in Greece, but I wish I was there, but I'm in Preston. It's sunny, but uh, without the pool. Great, thank you. And finally, Tiffany. Hi, I'm Tiffany Argent. I work for DB Schenker, who's a, a logistics freight forwarder. And I'm the QC cluster lead manager for the UK and Ireland. And I support the business with regards to health, safety, environment, quality, and well-being has now come onto my remit. So um, that's something that we'll talk about in a bit. Perfect. Thank you very much. Richard, let's start with you then. Uh, what adjustments do organisations need to consider as people start returning to the workplace and, and how can they help colleagues adapt to that change? It's a good question, uh, Ian, and I'm sure a couple of the other panellists will have some sort of practical uh, pieces of advice in terms of what they've actually done with their own people. So I'd just like to focus on something slightly, slightly different tangent. Um, I guess we're all familiar, aren't we, with the term that uh, change is one of the few constants in life. Uh, and never has that been truer than the last 14 months. Um, the only thing we can be certain of at the moment is the future is uncertain, change is happening all the time. But as humans, we, and I'm sure Peter will confirm this, is we're wired to want predictability and certainty. So as managers and leaders, everybody that's on this call, perhaps one of our most important roles, particularly at the moment, is to resolve that uncertainty for our people as far as it is practically possible for us to do. So perhaps there are two key things that people on this call need to consider. One, how we communicate to our people and how we lead our people. Now, by that, I mean, in terms of communication, you know, not treating our employees as one homage, homage, I can't say that word, homogeneous group. Um, you know, everybody has got different circumstances. We've got groups of people within our each organization with different needs. So our messaging, our support has to be based on that. So we're all gonna have people working from home, people already working at the workplace, people on furlough, people shielded. They're all going to have to make different adjustments. They've all got different challenges, uh, whether that's coming back to work, going back to the workplace, adopting hybrid practices, uh, or even if you've been at the workplace all the time, adjusting to others coming back and joining you, uh, that's gonna be a challenge for some people. Now, we all know that divisions have potentially been created between these different groups of people. So the challenge is not just about supporting people to adjust to changes to their own individual work practices, but perhaps more about how people reintegrate with each other. So how do we support individuals to better understand each other and to better respect the different needs of each other. So change, as we know, that drives uncertainty. 
and we all know that hinders our ability to adapt effectively. So perhaps a key role for everyone on this call as a leader is how we reduce that uncertainty. So for example, uh, the latest piece of research to come out of Westfield Health, it's a report called The Future of Work, suggests that 21% of employees haven't yet been told how they'll be working in the future. And 31% of those on furlough haven't yet received any details about their return to work. That may be just an issue of communication. It may be we just don't know, okay? Um, but we each need to be looking at, as our roles of leaders, what we're doing to build awareness of the future, uh, both short and medium term, and looking at how we support our people to best adapt to that. And perhaps most importantly, developing a culture that supports people to adjust to change and which is a conducive to encouraging people to integrate back together. So for me, it's all about the leadership that people on this call show in terms of managing and supporting their people. Thanks, Richard. Nick, I can see you nodding along there. Uh, what can you add from a sort of practical perspective from, from your experiences at Vodafone? So I think le leadership is absolutely key. It's something that we focused on very early on um, when we kind of went into the pandemic. There, there was so much information going around and we'll touch on that later. But we started to talk very frequently with our leadership teams and talking to them about actually what, is the, what are the qualities of a good leader? What do people look for in a leader that gives them the confidence and reduces that anxiety? Also, we also spoke to the business very frequently about the behavioural change curve as well. So how and getting people to understand that we go through change all the time, but it's, it's how do we get how do we help people transition from the initial shock to the acceptance um, and recognizing that everyone will be in a different place on that curve and, that, and they'll go through that curve multiple times. But the more we can kind of get people to be familiar with it and the more we can get people to recognize what helps them progress through those stages more quickly, that the better or, or more resilient they will be when it comes to further change in the future. So, uh, but, but leadership is a very good point and, and it's something I completely agree with. Thank you, Tiffany, if you've got anything to, to add from, from your experience? I think the adaptability aspect of, of people is sometimes underestimated. Um, you know, like um, Nick was saying that, you know, we, we do change or we, we have changes all the time uh, within our private life as at work. Um, and I think that we're an adaptable species. So being able to understand where we're going to be going, what kind of achievements um, we can get with regards to returning to work, that communication of how are we going to adapt? How is the business going to look? How is the operations, how are the operations going to look as we move forward? Um, I think that was a really key part for us that we're still adapting now, you know, as the government announced the other day that, you know, we're going to be postponing our, um, I hate using the freedom day, I hate using that word, um, but, we're, you know, that's now moved a month. So having that, right, okay, our mindset, we were going to be okay to get out and about on the 21st, now we're going to have to move to July. So being able to adapt our plans, our, our progress, um, I think has, has been key throughout. Peter, how do you think that, that change in deadlines are going to affect people's mindset in terms of people that may be looking forward to, to next week being able to have the shackles off, so to speak, and now they've, they've been set back by another four weeks? How as an employer can you help to deal with that? I think you, you have to um, set expectations, but, but um, there is a way of doing this. There's a compassionate and empathic way of doing it. And then there's a, what we would class as uh, transactional management, which is uh, very much telling you what to do. Um, I, I'll be honest, transactional management in a, in a post-pandemic world is going to look pretty freaky. Um, I would, I'd be much more inclined to be doing transformational leadership and management. You know, if you think that we, 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 we set out and said to our people, you can't possibly work from home. Well, you are now. Uh, you can't possibly do all the, all the you can't possibly is in work gone right out the window. So I think adaptability, absolutely. But I, I think organisations have to adapt. Um, and uh, so we, you, it, individuals adapt, but organisations have got to adapt with them, which means we've got to look at um, the way we, we manage people's mental health. Uh, uh, ISO 45003 came out last week, uh, International Standard on Psychological Health, Safety and Wellbeing. Um, it, it's there. Uh, unfortunately, we, we talked about this before, Ian, um, too much concentration on the individual and teaching the individual, making them mindful, making them resilient. 
Uh, I, I want resilient, mindful organizations. <laughs> I want the same principles in there. And that's what's going to get us, I believe, through the pandemic and address this question is how do you soothe people's sense of what's coming next? Well, you give them information in a caring and compassionate way. Um, there are managers like that, trust me. <laughs> I've seen them. I work with I work with one of them. So it, you know it's, it is possible. And, and Richard, I, I, when we do kind of um finally get back to that day when people are going to be you know coming into work more regularly how important is it as an employer that you, you reassure your staff and make them feel safe about returning to work and do you have any tips on, on how they do that there's obviously going to be a lot of anxiety about um about commuting into the office again being around people again um how, how do you guard against those those uh, fears for, as an employer yeah well it's, it's critical isn't it just picking up from peter's point is if, if we bring it back to leadership we might say that we've got a moral or legal op obligation to make people safe now, whether that's feeling safe, that feeling safe is much a, as much about mental concerns as it is about what we might traditionally think sort of physical safety. And that dovetails back to what Peter was saying is that that's going to be driven by compassionate men, leadership. Yeah. Uh, not the do as, do as I say leadership style. So again, a lot of things are going to change. Uh, again, a little like the first topic we discussed, you know, we do recognize that we have to recognize what our people's needs are. How different are they within our organization with different groups of, of people? Uh, I'd ask everybody on this call, how, have you actually talked to your people yet to understand how they feel? Do you understand having taught them what support they're gonna need? You know, what, what are your people's concerns gonna be? Are they related to coming back into the workplace? Perhaps it's more about traveling into work rather than actually being in the workplace. Or the challenges of not coming back into the workplace and having to stay at home. You know, people, all everybody's going to be different in this respect. And it's up to us as leaders and managers to, to understand our teams better uh, as an organization. And it, it's not just about work, you know, but how will people have to adapt their home commitments and life work balance. So for an awful lot of us, actually the pandemic has been a godsend in terms of work-life balance. How are we gonna adapt and adjust back away from that? And what, what fears, what concerns, how does that affect our worries about what, what the future is gonna look like? And are we gonna have to specifically focus on groups of employees, perhaps with a little bit more focus and attention, for example, those that are shielding, uh, how, how do they feel ab about returning back to the workplace? Those on furlough. Now I mentioned the Westfield uh, report, Future of Work before. Uh, one of the findings is after a year of disruptive routines, constant change, half of people questioned were, were eager to rekindle that sense of normality, if you like, and return back to the workplace. But half were also worried about returning to work. Yeah, it's that two sides of the coin thing. And this worry varied significantly by both sector and company. So we found that more than two thirds of people working in transport and logistics were worried about returning to the workplace, whereas just 40%, and I say just 40%, that's an awfully big number, uh, from manufacturing and construction. So there'll be sectoral differences, probably linked to the types of work people are doing and what their experience work-wise has been over the last 14 months. We also found that employees in smaller businesses appear less concerned about returning than those in larger companies. So, so what does that say about things and in terms of the, perhaps the efforts we need to make if we are part of a larger organization? And the report also looked at what companies were doing to help people overcome the worry of returning to the workplace and what employees actually wanted. Not always the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, as with any report, these create generalizations. So rather than go through those, like what I'd suggest everybody on this call should be doing is asking ourselves, what have we done to talk to our people to find out what they want? what their needs are, and then what are we proactively as an organization doing to make sure those needs are met as best we can, okay? 
Tiffany, I'll bring you in here. Obviously, Richard mentioned some of the uh, transport and logis logistics stats there. And uh, from from your background, what kind of um, information have, have, you, have you spoken to your staff? And does those does that stats reflect what you found within your own business? Um, as I, said, it, it, I was quite surprised um, with those statistics. I think that because of the industry that we're in, in um, transport and logistics and, and freight boarding, is the fact that we've been operational throughout. We've had people in our workplaces, so with the, the ensuring that those remained safe uh, and, and their well-being was looked after whilst in the workplace. We had over 50% of our colleagues working from home um, throughout the pandemic. And we have asked the question, we've used the tools that are available to us. So we've used a forms template on, on Teams um, and we've asked um, a, a good majority of our, of our colleagues, you know, what um, is hindering you coming back into that place? What are you concerned about? And to be fair, a high percentage of our colleagues like the, the working from home. They find themselves more productive because they have this good work-life balance, because their well-being is, is, has, been, um, is, has been looked after in the fact that they haven't got the, the, the commute into the office to have to deal with and the drop off of the school. It can be done as a holistic piece. That, so work and life have become more of a balance. Um, from a leader's perspective, it's that un uh, developing that trust with that workforce that's that's working remotely. Um, and I think that, that as we come in back into the workplace, this hybrid way of working is going to is going to be our new normal, our new way forward. Um, and understanding the needs of the individual, but still providing, as, as Peter was saying, the business aspect of it is is still understanding that we can still deliver the service to our customers to a very high standard, but not everybody has to be sitting in an office all the time. Um, but being able to adapt to that and, and lead by what our employees would like to see, as well as what the, the business needs. Could I just jump in there, Ian? Yeah. yeah. It, that, that was a perfect example, Tiffany, of what I was saying. My word of warning about reading reports, even though we produce them, is they always provide sweeping generalizations about a sector as a whole. Uh, what they don't, what that then clouds is, is those organisations that are exemplars, that are actually doing what they should be doing, uh, which obviously you guys are doing. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, when, whenever you see these trends, that's why I said, these are the trends, but actually just focus on what you as an organisation are doing, because only you can look after your organisation. Absolutely, Nick, you had your hand up there. Yeah, yeah, just a just a couple of quick points from me, really, because the um, so, so we've been talking to our business regularly throughout with um, through a whole variety of means, whether that be line line manager one to one conversations, all the way through to regular pulse surveys, and we've been using pulse surveys to understand how the organisation is feeling, not just in terms of our plans to return to an office, but plans for what a future what you know what does Vodafone look like in the future what do we want to be how do we want to look how do we want to operate uh, and what do our employees need um I, I I've heard very early on very frequently this, this conversation around productivity uh, and working from home I'm more productive as a business we are as productive or more productive working from home I, I always kind of just kind of air a, a word of caution on this one and to say, look, as an organization, you should understand whether, you know, whether that productivity is sustainable. Now, are people productive or more productive because they are more focused or is it because they are away from the office and they feel like they need to do more in order to be seen? And it's really important as an organization, we take that into consideration so that we're not basing our plans on assumptions. And those assumptions may mean that our plans aren't sustainable. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's really important to, to really understand the, the foundation on which you're making decisions for the future way of working. I just, I just wanted to add that point. Peter, we've obviously talked a lot about communication and HSE has been providing a lot of information throughout the last year, year and a half or so. But um, a question from the audience here, and do keep these questions coming in. How important is it to protect your, your leadership and your senior management? So obviously their, their job is to make sure that keeping the health and well-being of all the staff, uh, but how important is it to protect their health and well-being in order to help them do their job uh, correctly? Absolutely vital. Um, and it'd be, it'd be, you know... Everyone needs to be helping every part of the organisation. And just because you're a manager, you're not, or a, or a director, you're not autonomously devoid of any emotional integrity. 
um but you, you know if, if you are the same person and i i, I feel for you know i sit with these uh, sometimes with you know a board of directors and you know you you kind of like give them the or facilitate the option for them to talk about their own mental health um but it's very powerful when they do i mean there's a number of senior um directors from companies who have come forward and said um you know i i i too need to look after my own mental health i mean we were the um the chairman of of lloyd's bank came out very publicly and said this is you know that he was taking some time off and i think it's really important to look after our leaders uh but we look after them like we look after ourselves don't we, we, we which is we should be asking you know uh looking at the way we do things and, and not having the expectations that they, they because they're a leader they're going to work 18 hours why there's no justification for for that uh for that sort of rule uh you know so it, i think it's 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 important and in, re, in reference to this question but I know that we know already of a, a, a bank that has said categorically, you must go back into work, all of you. And I suspect in a few months from now, you'll, you'll, read, you'll be reading stuff that will say actually problems are rising because actually it's not about planning with the people. We're going back to the old way of working. We'll do it. But actually going back to the old way of working may not work. Um, and you can force it to work. But there, but something will give, and I think it's really important to um, to to consult with your employees, consult with your managers, consult with your leaders, and say what is it we can do to make the workplace um, a place that helps you to grow. I, I want to go back to work, but I want to be in an office because I'm a prolific talker, and you know I go for coffees with people, and I don't get the chance to do those. But you know, and it's nice to have that engagement. But I might only want to work three days. And then two at home. Yeah. So flexibility. Wow, I took a long time to answer a very short question. I apologize. Nick, I'm going to come back to you on, on this next point and kind of uh, tie in uh, another question that's coming from the audience, if, if I may. So obviously we've touched upon briefly about um, how the restrictions have been extended in the UK uh, and, and also kind of uh, the, the fear of infection. So how can you support those workers who are, who are still at, at risk of infection or still um, kind of at least fear that a risk of infection uh, and, and, and talk around a little bit about the importance of information and, and also kind of tying in this question from the audience, how much autonomy, autonomy do you think uh, um, you, as an organisation you're going to afford to, to your staff um, to have the choice of whether they feel safer to work at home if, if they want to? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think first and foremost, the point I'll make is that um, everyone is still at risk during this pandemic. You know, there, there, there shouldn't be an assumption that, that there is a percentage of the population that aren't. I think the, the difference is people, the, the varying degree of risk that someone um, is exposed to. And, and that's that's how we look at it. We, we don't try and, you know, assume percentage are safe and the percentage are unsafe. We just look at the right controls depending on the level of risk that an employee may or may not be exposed to. Um, and, and the vaccine is the obvious one there. But there are also um, roles within the business that, for example, people cannot socially distance uh, themselves. And, and, and we have that within Vodafone, and there are lots of other industries that can't as well. Healthcare is a good example. Um, and, there, and also there's a percentage of the workforce that they, they can't work from home. They, they, their job won't allow it. So they, they have to go into um, either an office or they have to go into someone else's office or they have to be mobile. Uh, and, and, and that's something we've been really, really mindful of, actually. It's, I think it's been very easy to focus too much on those people that are working from home and thinking as a business, you know what, we're OK because most of our people are working from home. There is a danger that you start to divide a workforce where there's, there is too much or predominantly all the conversation and information is around those working from home and what we can do better and more of to support them. And we take our eye off the ball with the guys and girls that are actually going out that are asked to be leaving the home during a time when as a, as a country we're asking people not to. So we, we absolutely recognize and, and, and show appreciation for you know, people like our retail staff and our engineers. The consultation's key. For me, it's, it's about listening to what they've got to say, the challenges they're facing, assuring them that as a business, we are listening and then responding appropriately, making sure that we're responding in a way that they recognize 
um, us as an employer that is putting their health, safety and well-being at the, the, the centre of our thinking. So it's about setting boundaries. We, we came across this problem very early on where we looked at, do you know what? We're only going to carry out critical work, business critical work. So we're only going to ask people to go out into the community if they absolutely have to. Then we needed to define what business critical work was. And then you have to make sure that that is aligned, um, that that aligns with the views and the expectations of others. And that can be very challenging when you're working with customers in different countries and things like that. So, so the decision making was very fluid, very agile, but ultimately it's about how do we install a degree of confidence in the workforce in the decisions that the business are taking so that they're not seeing business, uh, the business taking decisions based on how much we're going to make from this, but actually we're making decisions based on what is the best, what is, how is this going to impact um, negatively or positively on the health, safety, well-being of the workforce. The the information piece that you've touched on is really, really important, actually. Um, throughout the pandemic, there's been a real thirst for information. And where there is no information being provided, people go in, you know, in, in search of information. And they will look everywhere and anywhere for information. And um, so all a whole variety of re uh, sources, resources that, that they've looked at. That the pandemic has, has been accompanied by a, a wave of disinformation as well, and that's important to recognise. And, and we've seen very frequently how theories have fast become fact. Um, so I think as an employer, you have an opportunity to try and provide a bit of um, clarity. Um, and you do that by, by kind of showing, being consistent, I think, with the information being open about where you're getting information from, but also being honest about when you don't have the answers to something and what you are doing about it. Um, as an employer, there have been a lot of times where we don't have the answer to a question, and that's been really tough. But it, we have to recognise as a business that the pandemic is not something that we've, we've navigated before. So it is very new. Normally, you can go and lean on research and academic studies. But this hasn't been going on long enough to provide the data and, and you know, that then informs decision making. So decision making has been very, very fluid. Um, but we, we've never under, underestimated the, the, uh, the importance of clear, simple, consistent and regular communication, including if there's nothing to say as well. Um, and, and we do that as well by making sure that, for example, we would run webinars, we would bring experts into the business. So we would give people the opportunity to ask questions but ask questions of someone in a position that can give an answer that we have confidence in. So, um, and, and, and the, the added layer of complexity for us operating globally is that you're dealing with different sets of legislation in different countries uh, and different cultures as well. So globally, we look at how we can align um, all the, you know, the positions and we would look at organizations like the World Health Organization as well. But it, it, it's really not been easy, but we, we've just made sure that at the heart of all the decision-making is the health, safety and well-being of our employees. Tiffany, how have you found that from, from an information perspective? Obviously, it's been so much change and so much going on. How, how hard have you found it to stay up to date with accurate information and, and, and changes? I think because uh, we've managed across the UK and Ireland cluster here within DB Schenker, um, what, what that's, that's the piece I've been managing. And what we decided to do was, was go, we erred on the side of caution as such. So we made sure that we, um, we were using government guidance, we were using uh, from each, from, from both countries, from Ireland and the UK, and whichever was the more stringent we followed. And I think that with regular communication from our senior leadership to say that we're doing this because uh, where we want to keep our workforce safe, because as, as a few, as Nick was saying, you know, we have worked throughout. You know, we've had our workforce, we can't have a forklift truck driver take their truck home. So they've been working in the warehouse. So, you know, that's something that we've needed to, to achieve. Um, and there was that issue of splitting the workforce. I think that that, that was a concern at some point. Um, but we've made sure we provided opportunities for those at home and those um, within the workplace to still be able to communicate. Um, through webinars as, as similar to what Nick's done at Vodafone, so webinars and team meetings, but not just work-based. I think because we can get so bogged down in the day-to-day -day for those working remotely and, and this over-productivity is having the opportunity to socially interact, even though we're physically distancing. And that really supported, I think, our colleagues across the cluster. Um, and as a legacy perspective, we're communicating more. We're communicating with people we wouldn't have spoken to 18 months ago. 
because of this opportunity through technology um, and through, you know, through COVID and commute and socializing across um, different teams has been a, we're calling it the COVID legacy. You know, it's something that we're, it's, um, it's an advantage of, I think, as we move forward as a business of how we can re re retain that communication, but keeping that information that we're communicating relevant and to the point as a health and safety professional, we suddenly became the subject matter experts in COVID. You know, we suddenly were the ones to go, well, what do we do in this case? It's like, well, hang on, let me just go and check the website or, or the, the government guidance. And, and we were continually doing that, um, which any of the colleagues could have done. But I think they felt that the information coming from you know, the health safety and uh, environment department was, it, it felt more comforting for them. And I think that's, that's the whole piece of communication is, having the accurate information that we're aware of and being able to communicate it so that it's like, yes, you're doing the right thing. This is what we need to do with regards to isolation or shielding or um, as we move forward, you know, clean hand cleansing and space and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, I think, was a really key, key point. Richard, um, Nick touched on, on business critical work there. and um... We're actually in a really similar position to Nick. So the business I run is basically a coaching business. So we support corporate organizations by sending coaches out to those organizations to whether it's workshops, whether they're screening programs, uh, whether it's on-site gyms that we run for a client organization. So we've had this really interesting challenge that the whole business fell off the cliff March last year uh, in one week, and we had to reinvent the whole thing as a virtual proposition whether that's webinars whether it's online exercise classes all those types of things but as we've come back to the workplace we we've got as nick said we've got this two separate groups we've got the management team that can work from home but actually the vast majority of the coaches that their 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 delivery is based upon going to client sites so not only have we got to be really and there were good three words that nick used sort of consistent open and honest about how we support our coaches in terms of them feeling as comfortable as possible about visiting sites. We also have the added challenge that the different clients that we go to might have different standards that they operate to. Um, and so that creates quite a lot of, not just confusion, but um, concern amongst our coaching teams in terms of what environments are they, are they stepping into. And that's taken an awful, had to, an awful lot of work from us in terms of yes liaising with the clients and making sure that they've got the appropriate risk assessments before we come on site that type of thing but a huge amount of time invested in our own coaching teams and people just talking to them reassuring them making sure that they feel comfortable that they can come to you with any concern they have so that you can sort of navigate your way through things Thanks, Richard. Peter, we've had a few questions around this, this next point, so uh, it's quite uh, quite handy that we're moving on to this next. And, and how do we go about supporting employees with new or, or pre-existing social anxiety and, and groups excluded from, from social interaction? So we've touched on already how people some people have thrived from working from home, um, but if you've not, there's maybe some worries about commuting and, and returning to the office and, and being in big crowds again. How does it, you guard against that as an employer? I think you have to prepare your people and the different ways you can, uh, for some uh, going returning to the office, I know some companies have done videos of what the office will look like, this, the way it's set up. Um, I, I've also, for those of you who live in London, um, you, you know, tra traveling on the tube, on the buses, uh, you know, means that you actually, you, you may come into work with a heightened level of anxiousness or social, you know, social anxiety. Um, and I think what we really need to do is um, is build in straight away. Um, you come in and you have a dip, almost like a wind down time. You know, you have a cup of tea. You sit you sit with your mate, or you or, you, or if you don't have your mates, you go and sit somewhere else. But you just relax and get yourself out of out of that 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 sort of that space. Because if you go straight from a, a socially anxious situation into a pressured situation you don't give yourself any time to recover then it's going to be it's going to be difficult but we also have to um make it normal to have conversations with people i say to people how are you traveling it's not how are you because i'm fine it's how you're traveling so what does that feel like today um, you know if you were to describe your your journey into work 
what was it like? You know, would it was it a ten or was it a five? If it's a five, it's a bit bumpy. So you, it it's it, it enables and facilitates conversation, um, and also flexible working. You know, if 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 you've got someone who's got profound anxiety, do a phase a phase re return to the office and do flexible work to for help to to facilitate that. Um, you can refer them to if you have EAPs to get uh, you know medical intervention but what we're really talking about here is people returning to a place of work that was familiar which is going to feel unfamiliar straight initially and you've got to make it familiar make it make it okay to have that conversation um, you know I, interesting I've been in the office once and the the lady at the at, that serves the, at the coffee bar was desperate to talk to me she said no you're not going anywhere We've got. A, we need a five-minute catch-up, and I thought it was a brilliant illustration. You know, she wanted some normality, and uh, you know, and she made me a lovely, you know, a lovely latte um, because we have a uh, we have like a Starbucks franchise. <laughs> Very nice. So little things just make it normal to return to work and have conversations. And for, I think the other thing to remember is there are people, you know, such as Nick and Tiffany. Tiffany's work, but they've been working. Um, you can use those people that have been working to help people who may be coming back and going, well, you know what, it's, it, it's like this. And something sometimes the peers telling you something is more has more impact than you as a manager sometimes telling people, yeah. Tiffany, you've obviously been fully uh, operational during COVID. Can you talk a little bit about how you've managed the different groups of people? Obviously, there's been, there's been kind of three obviously clear groups of furloughed workers, people that have been in the office the whole time, staff that have worked from home. How have you kept your, your staff socially interactive while socially distancing? Well, what we've been doing is we we um, we identified that, that after, just as the second lockdown was coming in, that people were then going to feel more isolated. Um, so we, we initiated this wellbeing campaign and we really put a focus on having that social interaction. So using teams using zoom like this um but involving everybody so we had lunchtime quizzes um we went on zoom walks you know and involving people to not only you know stretch their intellectual well-being as well as their physical well-being so it's not i think one of the things that i identified at the beginning of, of learning about this because again it's it's a new kind of topic for for me personally as a health and safety professional um that i've had to learn about very quickly is well-being is not just mental health it's it's all other aspects so you know we, we involved people to to talk about um uh, we had financial health we, so we had the pensions people come in and talk to us about finances and investments and things like that so it kind of took them away giving that opportunity to come away from um their workstation because you know leverism is this great new term i think that's that's been banded around of people not leaving their desk you know uh, uh, so we we kind of kind of enforced but we we brought in our senior management team and they said we're not going to have any meetings between 12 30 and 1 30 every day and we won't do that so it gives everybody then all of our prices an opportunity to step away from their computer for an hour and say right between 12 30 and 1 30 we'll 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 have we'll, we will have a break we will stop working you know we won't be emailing at, at eight o'clock in the evening and expecting an email from you you know it's it's that kind of piece that has been led by our senior leadership team at DB Shanker. And that has, has filtered down across those different aspects. So with guys working in, in, in the workplace, in the warehousing and on our operational desks, together with people working um, at, at remotely and at home, the, the, the furloughed, um, I had somebody furloughed within my team and it was important, I felt, to keep in contact with them and reach out to make sure, how hey, you getting on, you know, We'll do a we'll do a Zoom chat or something, and and just to make sure that that they still felt connected to the business, um, and they weren't being is, isolated or, or or kind of forgotten, um, with all of us still working. So yeah, so I think that was really important. But using the technology that we've we've developed, well, not we've developed, but society has developed with Zoom and Teams. You know, we've never heard of it two years ago. Now it's integral to how we talk to people, and even just having a coffee um over the over a chat like this or um we we call it open um we just had an open meeting so it's like we were sitting in an office together we weren't necessarily chatting but we were just on a call so it's like there was somebody there but but not so still involving people and making it feel as much as normal as we possibly could 
Great, thank you. Just before we move on to the to the final point, because we're running a bit short on time, Nick, I know you had your, your hand up there, so I'd like to bring you back in. I was going to throw a quick question at you as well from the audience, which is coming, which relates to this point, um, which is around um, how you ensure businesses are, how, how you reassure your staff that, that those who are working from home are not left behind and how you guard against the anxiety around career progression if they're working from home and they're outside out of mind, perhaps? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really good question, actually. It's, it's, and it's something that we've been, we've been, talking about frequently across the business um i I think there's a i think you need to look at you know the the perception and the reality um you know how people are feeling and then how do you reassure them that that's not necessarily the case um and then how do you make sure that you know that that perception doesn't mean that they you know that they they lay a pressure on themselves to do something they're not comfortable doing like going into the office um I, i i guess we, we probably don't have all the answers to this at the moment, but by talking about it, um, you know, we, we are sending a signal to the business that we are mindful of it. Um, we are starting to look at how do people use technology? How do we retrain the business so that they use Teams and Skype and whatever it might be more effectively? So how do you engage people outside of the office more effectively within a within a, a meeting where you have a group of people sat in the same room but how do we make sure that we are consistent when we look at where our talent is and how do we provide the pathways and the opportunities to the talent how and so, so we have a lot of existing um, processes in place at the moment um, but we're looking to see how we strengthen all those the, the point I wanted to make on the well-being side is we we, we very frequently look at initiatives and the, the, the point that we we, we looked at very early on. We, we've been looking at it for some time now from a Vodafone perspective. It's not so much about the initiatives and just keep on throwing the initiatives. It's about how do we identify the conditions that we need to create across the business that enable the, the initiatives to be successful. And there is a big difference between the two. Um, and, and, and I would encourage everybody to, to kind of go away and take a look at that and have a think about that. Yeah, and, and not just keep throwing, not just keep re- reviewing and reinventing their well-being program and throwing new initiatives and doing yoga and painting, but understanding, you know, what is it that the people want? How accessible is it? How do you make sure that as a business you, al- you align what you say and what you do? It's really important. It's great having a CEO saying don't work out of hours. It's terrible if that email comes out of hours, if you know what I mean. It's a, it's a crude example, but it happens. So, so I, I would just take that as, and have a think about that. Thanks, Nick. I just want to bring Tiffany back in for the last couple of minutes on the, on the final point. And we've touched about a little bit about leaders and line managers before, but what guidance have you got for, for wellbeing leaders and line managers from, from your experience? And I believe you've, you've introduced a, a six pillars of wellbeing at DB Shaker. Can you talk a little bit about that for the last minute or so, please? Yeah. So as I mentioned previously, um, we did start an initiative, Nick. As I say, we were quite um, immature when it came to our well-being programme. So we really wanted a good kickstart um, with regard to uh, well-being. So we, we again, researched. We, we had these six pillars hitting on not just mental health, um, as I say, financial, physical, social, um, making sure that uh, we're raising awareness because I think with the leaders as well that their their lack of awareness maybe was was um, um, was was prevalent to the point of we weren't maybe handling it as well as we could have done. Um, so we we signposted our leaders to this 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 bank of resources that we obtained, and this was from our um, our healthcare providers. So we utilised partnerships we already had. So the Red Cross is our first aid provider. So we utilised their skills. Um, we looked at um, our, our healthcare providers as well as the NHS and Mind uh, charity. So we used that information um, and we filtered that information out. The engagement with guys in the warehouses, so events that we were holding, we were saying, you know, there's QR codes. They could use their phone to join in if they didn't have an email. We tried to think of as many ways as possible to raise that awareness. And the most important part we felt was to eliminate this stigma of, you know, we can't talk about mental health and because our demographic is kind of Gen X male, especially in the warehouses. So it's kind of that, you know, oh, I'll just get on with it kind of attitude or stop moaning and man up kind of that whole culture was was quite embedded. Whereas now we identified those kind of, um, we identified a couple of, of, of those, those kind of key influences, those guys that had got it, 
within that demographic to influence the others. And that kind of got the ball rolling and has developed our culture to have us a, a, with a longevity of our program. Um, and as I say, I know we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll make it really quick. Um, but as I say, what we've done is we've, we've set a framework up with our program that's now um, has this longevity and is now integrated into our onboarding program. It's, we've now got policies and it's now a way of how we work. Um, and we're really quite proud of what we've achieved at DB Shankar. All right, thank you very much. Unfortunately, that is uh, that is all we've got for time for today. I really, really appreciate you uh, joining in and engaging so well with the webinar. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, uh, if you missed it for any reason or, or any of the content from the first three days, uh, you are uh, able to access it on demand, as well as all the sessions from the co-located shows uh, on the platform until the end of July. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Tiffany Argent, Nick Wright, Peter Kelly and Richard Holmes for their times this, uh, this afternoon and to our sponsors, Westfield Health. If you want to find more from Westfield Health and how they can help your business, uh, please do visit their, their booth in the platform and request a meeting. I'm going to be back at two o'clock tomorrow for another live webinar where we're going to be looking at creating culture of compliance. In the meantime, don't forget to check out the meetings platform, browse some, browse some exhibitor booths uh, and have a look around. Thank you very much for your time and see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.